Hello, and thank you for joining us for the USF Lecture Series, a virtual program of the Allen County Public Library. My name is Erin Warzala, and I'm, I'm the Assistant Manager of the DuPont Branch. And I will be today's host. This program is being recorded. In order to improve the quality of everyone's listening experience, your microphones have been muted. If you have a question or comment, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. We will also use chat to facilitate a question and answer session at the end of the program. So tonight we have Dr. Matthew Hope, Associate Professor and Department Director of Kinesiology and Nutrition. He's from the University of St. Francis in Fort Wayne. Please welcome Dr. Hope. Thank you. Uh, I am Dr. Hope. I am the Associate Professor of Kinesiology at the University of St. Francis, and I would like to thank the Allen County Public Library for offering this uh, service and allowing uh, faculty at the University of St. Francis the opportunity to come and uh, provide you with information. Uh, please do ask questions. Um, I realize that this is uh, being broadcast virtually, so please use that chat option to ask questions. Um, the more questions, the better. Um, it helps to uh, hopefully get that information across to uh, our viewers tonight. So uh, the title of my presentation tonight is Implementing um, Aging Doesn't Does Not Have to Be Painful. So um, we're going to go through a few slides here and then hopefully have some questions at the end to uh, expand upon uh, this information. So first, um, just the definition of what inflammaging is, probably a term that most people have not heard of. Uh, so the definition of inflammaging is that it's uncontrolled chronic inflammatory process that contributes to the development of age-related diseases. So I'm sure at some point in time, most people have heard or read or been exposed to the fact that inflammation is good and it's necessary and part of the healing process. And that is true. If you sprain your ankle, your ankle will become inflamed, which is necessary to have that sprained ankle heal. So in the acute situations, we want inflammation. We need inflammation to occur in order to have the healing process uh, take place. It's the chronic inflammatory processes that can lead to debilitating age-related uh, disease and disorders. And we're going to talk about tonight how this occurs. So. When it's when inflammaging says that it's uncontrolled chronic inflammatory process, uh, the key word being chronic. So this, these age-related diseases, these age-related disorders, they do not happen overnight. So it's years and years and years of habitual ha um, lifestyle choices that the individual is making, typically that will lead to these age-related uh, diseases and disorders. So I pose a question uh, to the audience. So how is, how is it that two individuals the same age can have drastically different states of health? So we see individuals as they age. So individuals in their 20s and 30s typically can do the same types of activities, can go about their life in similar manners. But as we continue to age, we get into the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, we have individuals who are, when we look at them functionally or from a uh, health perspective, um, we can have drastically different states of health. We can have those individuals in their 70s and 80s that are still running and playing with their grandchildren at the park. And then we have the individuals in their 70s and 80s who are not able to go to the park with their grandchildren, um, to play ball, to push them on the swings, to do whatever they would like to do. So why is it or how is it that two individuals the same age can have such different states of health? Can be, one can be pretty much live the life that they would like to live, do the activities that they would like to do, and then we have the other individual who is limited in what they can or can't do. So inflammaging has uh, an effect on those different states of health. Uh, hormetic adaptation. So here's another big word that I'm sure a lot of people have never heard of. So this also uh, has to do with inflammation and inflammaging. So 
definition of hormetic adaptation. So an exposure to a low dose of an agent that is toxic at high doses, but at low doses induces an adaptive, potentially beneficial effect on the cellar organism. So again, this is inflammation. Inflammation at a low dose is great. It has a beneficial effect on the cell or the organism. So again, you sprain your ankle, your ankle is inflamed, it's red, it's hot, uh, it's swollen, all signs of inflammation. It's beneficial to you because that redness, that swelling, the pain is going to allow for that ankle to heal. However, high doses, chronic doses of inflammation is detrimental. So it's not going to help the individual's overall health, the individual's overall well-being of how they're going to go about their life and how they're going to do what it is that they do. So any exposure to a low dose of something that could be beneficial but is not beneficial at a high dose is what a hormetic adaptation is. So when we look at inflammation and inflammaging, so that chronic state of inflammation, it's you can see on the slide that as the hormetic adaptation becomes smaller and smaller, the amount of inflammaging becomes larger and larger. The larger the amount of inflammaging present in the individual, so the, amount, the larger amount of that chronic inflammatory condition that is present within the individual, the less they are able to exhibit health and exude health and have the body function in that homeostasis state where the body is functioning within the normal range of where we would expect the body to function. So there's five signs, five cardinal signs of inflammation. First one would be redness, second one is swelling, third one is heat, fourth one is pain, and the fifth one is loss of function. So again, going back to the example of spraining your ankle and that acute inflammatory state, sprain your ankle, it's gonna be red, it's gonna swell. If you place your hand on that swollen, inflamed, sprained ankle, it's gonna be hot, typically you're gonna have pain, and you have loss of function because you're not gonna be able to walk how you're supposed to. The ankle's not gonna be able to move how it's supposed to. So those five signs are typically present in an acute inflammatory condition, such as stepping off the curb, stepping on a stone, rolling your ankle, spraining your ankle. Those are necessary signs. We need those signs to happen. We need those signs to occur in order to have the body heal that injured ankle. Causes of inflammation or causes of chronic inflammation would be obesity, uh, increased gut permeability, disruption of the microbiome, uh, the cessation of cell division, and then dysfunction of the mitochondria. So drastically different causes of between acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. And ultimately, with these five different signs of chronic inflammation, we are working on a cellular level. So uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. Purpose of the mitochondria, the function of the mitochondria. You have mitochondria in every cell in your body. The purpose of those mitochondria is to produce ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. It is the universal energy molecule. This is how your body it creates this energy molecule. It creates ATP and it uses ATP to drive other biochemical reactions that happen in the body. So in that chronic state, the mitochondria are no longer functioning how they're supposed to. So if the mitochondria are no longer functioning how they're supposed to, we're not going to create energy how we're supposed to. So now the body is lacking energy. So if the body is lacking energy on that cellular level, it's going to lead to some type of dysfunction, some type of disease, depending on what cell type is being affected and what my, the mitochondria within that cell type and how they're being affected. Um, the cessation of cell division. So the cessation of cell division is where the body is no longer proliferating or creating new cells. So all cells have a life cycle. So for example, your red blood cells live 120 days. So every 120 days, you have a brand new batch of red blood cells. The cells in your stomach last about three to four days. Uh, so due to that harsh environment with the hydrochloric acid in your stomach, those cells in your stomach are replacing themselves every three to four days. So 
uh, every cell has a life cycle. So if we stop creating new cells, so if the body is no longer able to create those new cells, that it's also going to lead to some type of disease or disorder down the road. Uh, the disruption of the microbiome. So within our digestive system, we have millions, billions, trillions of bacteria that live within our digestive system. These bacteria are necessary to allow for health to occur. So if we are uh, not feeding those bacteria correctly, so if we are eating food that uh, is not necessarily healthy for that microbiome for those bacteria, it is also going to lead to a chronic inflammatory state, lead to potentially disease disorder down the road. Uh, the increased gut permeability. So within our digestive system, we see that the food that you eat, it needs to be absorbed. It needs to be absorbed correctly. So if the gut, if the digestive system is not permeable enough, if the digestive system is too permeable, it's going to affect the body. So we're either going to not absorb enough nutrients or we're going to have those nutrients leak out of the digestive system and again could lead to disease or disorder. And then that final condition or final sign of inflammation, that chronic inflammatory state, um, obesity. So obesity puts a lot of extra stress and strain up upon the body, upon the systems of the body. So cardiovascular system, respiratory system, uh, skeletal system, um, and as well as the muscles that attach to the skeletal system. So by having that extra weight being present in, on, and around the body, around the organs, in the organs, it's going to also lead to potentially disease and disorders as um, that continues. So as we go on in the talk here, we're going to talk about ways to um, try to prevent or counteract these five signs of the chronic inflammatory state. Again, acute inflammatory state is good, it's beneficial. We need that acute inflammatory state, but the chronic inflammatory state of inflammaging is uh, detrimental to the overall health of the person. So uh, with this slide here, it's a wonderful slide. We can see uh, throughout our life, the body is constantly adapting to different stresses placed upon the body. So whatever those stresses might be, physical stress, psychological stress, chemicals, outside agents such as bacteria and viruses, uh, fungus, whatever that outside uh, microscopic organism might be, the body is constantly adapting to it, which is a wonderful thing. And the body has great capabilities to adapt to these outside agents. And we need that constant challenge. The body needs that constant challenge in order to stay strong. So we need to have physical stress. We need to have psychological stress. We need bacteria and virus to constantly be challenging our immune system. By having these different challenges, uh, the body grows strong as a result from it. Um, an often overlooked stressor uh, on the body is food. So food, obviously something that we need every day. We must eat every day. We must gain those nutrients in order to uh, heal the body, in order to fuel the body, in order to repair the body. We need that food to be present, so we need to eat food. But it's the types of food that we eat. Are we eating the correct amounts? Are we eating the correct types? Um, where is that food coming from? How is it sourced? How is it grown? If uh, we're eating meat, how is that animal being fed? Uh, if we're eating dairy, how is that dairy animal being fed? What, what food is our food eating is an often overlooked uh, consideration by most people. Um, there's a lot deeper aspect to food than uh, what most of us realize or think about as we're eating. Um, a lot of it is just to, food is just a way to not be hungry. But there's a lot more to that. Um, also on that slide, we can see um, whether we're in a state of inflammation or not in a state of inflammation. So if we are not in a state of chronic inflammation, um, the body is functioning at its optimum. And that's ideally what we want. 
So we have a great balance between all aspects of health. So physical, mental, emotional, social, uh, financial, environmental, all those dimensions of wellness are in a good balance. The, the body, the individual, the person is in a good place and everything is functioning how they're supposed to. Anytime any of those dimensions of wellness starts to uh, become out of balance, then we can lead to that chronic inflammatory state. If the body is left in that chronic inflammatory state for too long, ultimately we end up with some type of disease or disorder. So all of those dimensions of wellness have to be in balance with each other. If we're doing well um, psychologically, we're in a good place. Mentally, we're in a good place. But let's say physically, we're not in a good place. It's going to take its toll over time. So all those aspects need to be working together in order to have the body functioning at its optimum. So how do we counteract this chronic uh, inflammatory state. So there's three basic ways to counteract that chronic inflammatory state, the inflammation. Number one is diet. What are we eating? Number two, how much are we moving? And three is uh, mental health. What are we thinking about uh, on that on a daily basis? So with uh, diet, what are we eating? So what I found through doing research on this, talking with uh, other individuals working with individuals on this is that most of us are not drinking enough water so and that's a pretty easy thing to fix if we just choose to drink a wa drink the water so it's a choice ultimately when it comes down to it to make sure we drink more water make sure we're staying hydrated uh, your body is you know depending on what you the source you look at potentially 65 to 70 percent water so we need to stay hydrated. By drinking enough water, we're staying hydrated. That's going to help those biochemical processes occur. Um, secondly, uh, what type of food are you eating? Are you eating pure food or are you eating processed food? So if we're eating a lot of processed foods, if we're eating a lot of foods with sugars, high sugar content, that's going to be very stressful on the body. So we're, again, the diet is leading to physical stress on the body. So those high sugar foods, those high sugar diet, it's causing extra stress to be placed on the body. And ultimately that stress is leading to inflammation. And then if you continually eat those high sugar foods, uh, you're in that chronic state of inflammation. So when you have the opportunity to choose what to eat, should we eat high sugar processed type foods or what about eating more chemical free foods, less sugar foods, uh, locally produced type foods? So luckily we're living in Northeast Indiana right now. Uh, at least most of us are living in Northeast Indiana and we have a wonderful network of local farmers and artisans who um, are creating some very uh, not only delicious, but nutritious foods and making it available. So the more local one can eat, um, the more pasture based one can eat where those animals are out on grass, where those animals are being fed uh, a diet in which they would typically eat if they were out in nature. Um, that is going to really help that individual, especially if they're already in a chronic state of inflammation, it'll help hopefully reverse some of those inflammatory processes um, and help bring the body back towards a state of balance, help reduce that inflammation, and hopefully help reduce um, some of those diseases and disorders that could potentially be occurring in the individual. Secondly is movement. And it does not have to be anything fantastic. It's simply going for a walk. Um, if you're at work, being able to get up if you have a job, a desk job, um, you're in a cubicle, if you're something like that, and you don't get a lot of movement throughout the day, the ability just to maybe stand at your desk while you're working in front of your computer instead of sitting for eight to 10 hours a day. Um, just getting up and moving. There's such fantastic benefits that occur from movement. You know, just the simple going for a walk. You don't have to have an elaborate 
you know, workout room at home. You don't have to have uh, fantastic equipment. If you do have that, awesome, it's great. But it can just be simple things like going for a walk, push mowing your lawn instead of riding uh, a mower to mow your lawn. Um, just going to, just getting up and making sure that you are moving your body. Um, just the simple things, you know, taking the stairs instead of the elevator or the escalator, parking a little bit farther away and walking across the parking lot to get those couple extra steps in. By moving, we're causing the cardiovascular system to have to work a little bit harder. It's pumping that blood. The skeletal system is squeezing the lymphatic system. So every time your muscles contract, those mus skeletal muscles are squeezing the lymphatic system, which is moving the lymph throughout your body. By moving that lymph, we're helping to get rid of toxins in the body. So if we can get rid of those toxins, that's going to help overall health as well. So just the ability to move and doing it on a daily basis. And it does not have to be hours and hours at a time. Simply if you can get in five more minutes a day, 10 more minutes a day of just moving. So again, take the stairs at work instead of the elevator, park a little bit farther away, walk across the parking lot. Simple things that it's not really causing you to have to go out of your way to get that movement in is extremely beneficial in the long run. So we're, again, we're talking about years. So inflammation, chronic inflammation, it takes years to get to that state. So if we can just do a few little things over time and be continuous with those and be diligent in doing that, um, it'll be extremely beneficial. Uh, and then third, one of the most often overlooked aspects to health is one's mental health. So um, doing those things which will help someone mentally, um, whether it's you know, yoga, meditation, um, having a good friend, having um, just that outlet for you uh, mentally, to keep your mental health in balance is extremely important. Um, we all suffer with mental health at different times throughout our life, um, some more severe than others, some more often than others, um, but it's one of those things um, that I talk to my students about is um, if someone becomes injured, let's say they, uh, you know, they tear their ACL, it's an injury. You know, mental health is also an injury, but it's one of those things where Oftentimes we're afraid to talk about it, and if we can talk about it, if you have that outlet for someone to talk to, um, it's gonna help keep everything in balance and ultimately help a person's overall health and well-being. So takeaway message um, that I would just like to get across tonight is that inflammation, that chronic inflammatory state takes years to uh, happen not something that occurs overnight. These age-related diseases occur years and years and years in the making. So um, it's not, it does not happen. You wake up one day and you have these age-related diseases, these age-related disorders. So if we can make small, subtle changes where maybe we drink a few less uh, sugary drinks throughout the day, we take the stairs when we're at work, we make a conscious effort to go on a walk every day, five, 10 minute walk every day around the neighborhood. Those few small subtle changes, after you get home from the walk, instead of having that sugary drink, you have a glass of water. Those little subtle changes over time will have a huge effect on one's overall health and uh, will make a drastic difference um, in the end. Please contact me with your questions. So um, there's my email address. Um, I've been lucky enough to meet a lot of wonderful uh, healthcare providers and farmers in Northeast Indiana to help you with that. So if they're a healthcare provider, they can help you um, maybe design that plan to help with some of these age-related diseases and disorders. Um, if you're looking for local farmers who grow wonderful food, wonderfully nutritious foods, whether it's produce or meat or dairy um, or eggs or anything like that. I've, uh, I know quite a few of these individuals. I've had the wonderful opportunity to work with them, um, visit their farms, visit their practices if they're a healthcare provider, talk with them, 
Um, there's some real amazing people in Northeast Indiana that a lot of us don't know about. So I'd love to uh, be able to help you uh, get in contact with these individuals if um, this is something that you're interested in and in trying to decrease that chronic inflammatory process or help with some of those age-related uh, diseases or disorders that you might be suffering from. So thank you for the opportunity to uh, provide some of this information to you. And I believe at this time, we'll be taking uh, some questions. We actually have a lot of great questions for you. Great. Um, so the first one is, how do doctors diagnose a chronic state of inflammation? Um, the, what I've found in, in talking with these various healthcare providers is that they'll really take time to do that initial case history uh, with the person and just go over their health history. So it's not necessarily one specific test that they could do to say you have chronic inflammation, but really finding out Okay, how much sleep do they get? How much stress do they have in their life? What are they eating on a daily basis? What type of exercise or movement are they getting uh, within the day? And then combining that information with blood tests, those types of things, so we can see, okay, what's happening on that biochemical level as well. So um, it's more than just taking, getting some labs. It's combining the labs with individual individualized attention to this person as to what's truly happening in their life and getting that holistic full picture and then helping them devise a plan. So our next question um, kind of goes for diet and it's um, can the quality of fruits and vegetables affect your infl inflammation levels and if so what should we look out for? Um, yes definitely quality can uh, affect the inflammation and that is a tricky question because um, there's a lot of marketing associated with foods um, so what I have found to be the best is if you can shake the person's hand that grew that food and you can go visit where that food came from then you know exactly how that food was grown the soil that it was grown in the care that that individual put into growing that food um, because one, a food could be labeled with whatever label, but the labels are tricky to read. So, um, and again, in Northeast Indiana, we have a lot of awesome local farmers mm -hmm. that are more than happy. If you reach out to them, they'll love to have you come out. I've visited lots of different farms, talked to lots of different farmers. Um, they are happy to show you what they do. They're proud of what they do, and they want people to see what they do. They take great pride in being able to grow that food for you. We have an excellent farmer's market as well. Yes. So I, I like to go there on the weekends <laughs> and pick up some fruits and veggies. Wonderful so. farmer's markets yes. you know, in all of Northeast Indiana. Okay, so the next question um, asks, does inflammation increase the risk of a stroke? Uh, potentially, yes. Okay. There's a lot of different factors that could lead to a stroke, but with being in that chronic inflammatory state, uh, you know, if we go back to those causes of inflammation, the obesity, increased gut permeability, disruption of the microbiome, the cessation of cell division and mitochondrial dysfunction, all of those are gonna to lead to an imbalance within the body. So that imbalance in the body due to inflammation could potentially lead to any type of disease or disorder. Okay. Um, going back to um, more of a movement-based question, um, do you have any tips on staying motivated after physical therapy ends? Oh, that's a great question. Really, it's what I have found is what do you enjoy doing? You know, mm -hmm. if it's, it has to be enjoyable because if, what it, if it's not enjoyable, now it's just another chore to check off the list for the day. So if you enjoy playing golf, go play golf. If you enjoy going on a walk with your dog, go on a walk with your dog. If you enjoy you know, riding a bike, if you enjoy going to a weight room, something, it just has to be enjoyable, something that you look forward to doing. And it's just the fact that you are moving. So it doesn't, like I said before, it doesn't have to be fantastic. It doesn't have to be extravagant, but make it something that you look forward to doing on a daily basis. If you don't like to run, don't force yourself to run because you're just miserable. If you enjoy riding a bike, especially if you have a 
you know, a friend, a spouse, a child, whoever to ride that bike with, mm -hmm. now it's time that you're able to spend and talk with that person. So make it enjoyable is ultimately what I would suggest. Mm -hmm. So um, we are at a library currently. So um, somebody is asking, do you have any recommendations on any books um, or articles about an anti-inflammatory diet? And if that's something that we need to email you and you, <laughs> you get back to us, we can yes. absolutely do that too. I mean, right here off the top of my head, I don't have any in particular, but yes, if you email me, I can get you a whole list of books. Sure. So. Awesome. Um, another question, and um, this is not my question, but I, it's a good one. I um, totally would like to know the answer. Is foam rolling helpful at all? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So um, foam rolling has tremendous benefits mm -hmm. for the body. Um, and then I get asked the question a lot of times, you know, what type of foam roller? It, it's, it's kind of like a pillow, whatever is comfortable to you. I mean, some are, there's huge foam rollers, there's mm -hmm. small that are plastic and really rigid. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of whatever you're comfortable with. But yes, foam rolling is extremely beneficial. Lots of different reasons why it's beneficial. So. Okay. And then, um, does genetics play a role in inflammation at all? Um, are some people more predisposed than others? Yes, they are. So genetics does play a role in this. Um, and I heard a, I was talking with a, a local healthcare provider about the, um, just inflammation, chronic inflammation, um, what she does with her patients. And um, her quote to me is that um, genetics uh, loads the gun but diet pulls the trigger. So with your genetics, some people are predisposed to cardiovascular issues. Some people are predisposed to cancer. But depending on how you feed that genetics, it can change. So uh, I, I never really thought about it that way. But yes, your genetics, some people are more, more predisposed. And again, so if you go to, to a healthcare provider and they really take the time to get that health history, not only about you, but your extended family, then they'll know more about you ultimately, and then combined with other information, can really set out a really good plan to help you with whatever you're, whatever you're needing help with or wanting help with. Okay. Um, earlier in the lecture, you had uh, or mentioned um, about the um, the stomach's microbiome, microbiome, and good bacteria and things like that. Um, are there any foods that are particularly good for promoting that healthy biome, or um, is it just all healthy food in general? So fermented foods. Okay. So um, any like fermented beverages, fermented foods in general. Um, so things like yogurt. Yep, like yogurt, kefir, kombucha, those types of foods um, really help to promote um, that microbiome. Um, you know, if you do a simple, you know, internet search of, you know, foods that, that are beneficial to the microbiome, a whole list will come up and there's lots of different foods. And, you know, again, farmer's market, great place to go get these types of foods. Um, you had mentioned um, drinking more water, which I think, you know, is something that everybody can do more of. Um, right now, there's you know this craze of um, Lacroix and different sparkling <laughs> waters. What is your view on those? Does that count as water, or should we just be drinking our regular H two O? I mean, <laughs> if we want to, ideally, just drink H two O. But if you have a choice between Lacroix and something you know some type of sugary drink, Lacroix is way better. But um, I guess I haven't really looked at the label of LaCroix because personally- I have, it's a bunch of zeros. Is it? Okay. <laughs> it's a bunch of zeros, no calories, no sweeteners. Okay, um, so yeah, if it's a bunch of zeros, mm -hmm. I guess I haven't done a lot of research into those types of drinks as to like how they're made mm -hmm. and how they, I've only tried it once and I didn't like it. So I never, <laughs> I never- It's an acquired taste for I never drank it again. <laughs> so um, I don't really, I guess I don't really know what, whole lot about it, but if it's a bunch of zeros on the label, that's typically a good thing. Okay. And again, if you have to choose between LaCroix and some type of sugary type drink, LaCroix is going to be way better for you. Okay. All right. Um, at this point, um, if anybody in the audience has um, any other questions, please feel free to go ahead 
and um, put them in the chat. Um, I just have one more uh, question. So unless any other questions come through, um, we'll be wrapping up the question and answer session. Um, so we had talked about, you know, decreasing sugar. Mm -hmm. um, what is your stance on um, sugar substitutes? So sugar substitutes are interesting um, in the fact that depending on the specific type of sugar substitute, um, your body may or may not be able to break that down. So if that's the case, is it is that sugar substitute decreasing the amount of stress on the body or increasing the amount of stress on the body? So um, ultimately, if we can just decrease the overall amount of sweets, mm -hmm. whether it's straight sugar or sugar substitute or even you know, your natural sweeteners such as like maple syrup and honey, they're still sweet. Mm -hmm. So the less sweet we have in our diet, it's going to ultimately lead to less stress, which leads to less inflammation on the body. Gotcha. All right, so it looks like we do not have any more questions. Um, again, if you do have questions, please feel free to go ahead and get them into the chat, but I do not see any more questions. So we will go ahead and wrap this up. Um, the library, of course, does have a variety of resources in um, both print and online about um, inflammation prevention, treatment, and diet. Um, if you have any follow-up questions or comments, um, of course, you can um, email Dr. Hope. He can um, clue you in. But you are also welcome, um, particularly if you have any questions about the resources that we have here at the library, um, please feel free to um, contact your local ACPL branch um, or send us an email at ask at acpl.info. Um, if you shoot us an email, we can go ahead and put books on hold for you, anything that you need. Um, so thank you so much for participating tonight. Um, Dr. Hope, thank you for coming out and sharing this information. You're welcome. Um, this is the last University of St. Francis lecture series of the spring semester. We will return with a new set of lectures in the fall. Um, if you are interested in attending those pro uh, programs or any other upcoming ACPL programs for adults, children's, or teen, please feel free to visit the Allen County Public Library's website at www.acpl.info. Um, you will find a comprehensive listing of events under the Events tab located at the top of the homepage. Some of the events um, do ask that you register in advance, so please take note of that. On behalf of Dr. Hope and the staff at Access Fort Wayne, thank you for attending tonight's program and have a good evening.